This is Life Rewired, the Brain Injury Podcast, for survivors, by survivors. And now your host, Rob and Ashley. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to Life Rewired. And my set just fell before me. I don't know what that crash was. And thankfully, the people at home didn't hear that. But Renee got a good giggle out of that. <laughs> Renee is our our guest today. Hi, Renee. Hi, Rob. Before we begin, I want to encourage our viewers, because I always forget to do this. I'm the worst YouTuber ever. If you would be so kind to just subscribe to the channel and click that like button, that helps us out more than you know. That helps get this channel visible to other people who need to hear this content. So if you would just do that, we would very much appreciate it. Today, we're talking with Renee Reddy, and I have known Renee for, gosh, it's getting close to a year now, I think. But uh, Renee? I'm sorry, Rob, but time's not my thing. (laughs) (laughs) Do you you act like you have a brain injury or something? Yes, you would probably think that. (laughs) Yes. Well, well, thank you for inviting me, Rob. I've been looking forward to it. I've been watching all your um, episodes. Um, I think it's really a good thing to hear what other people with brain injuries say and the stuff that they go through because that way you don't feel so alone. Because if you talk to just regular people, they don't understand. No, they do not. And they do kind of <laughs> try and squash it you know, squash the conversation. And a lot of them seem to be experts on brain injuries. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had somebody tell me not too long ago, oh, no, you can't go on a road trip because that is way too remote and you don't have cell phone coverage. And I was like, what's me? You can't tell Renee what to do. (laughs) (laughs) The only person that gets to tell me what and what not is my husband. And I can probably remember three times since I know him 15 years that he told me no. Your husband's very supportive and I appreciate that. Yes. You know, the, the thing about him that I really like is he doesn't treat me like um, like I'm Disabled. of lesser value. Yeah. Um, for my previous trip, I had to move the attachment point for the strap that holds the water can in position. I had to move it back two inches to make more room for the sleeping bag. Can you believe that two inches makes a difference? But it did. <laughs> and I got the whole thing right. And I, I tightened the bolt back up and realized that I didn't attach the strap to it. And I just came up with a couple of my very well-known words that I like to say when I'm I'm happy about something. (laughs) And he was within range to hear me, and he didn't even respond. And so it was like, okay, take the bolt back out, put it back in the right way, and get it right. And, And I really appreciated that because if he came over and did it for me, I wouldn't have gotten the satisfaction. Yeah, you screwed it up, but you know what? You fixed it. Yeah, he knows to stay in his own lane, and whenever it's time (laughs) for help, you're going to ask him for the help. (laughs) Yes, and he does know that by the time I show up and say, I can't find my shoes, or have you seen this or that, or I can't get this right, or the lawnmower won't start, you know, by the time Mm -hmm. I come and actually say these things, don't give me directions. Just come on over and help me, because that is what I want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? He I was just thinking about today what what will I talk about during this thing and and I was like right after the injury, which I probably should talk about. Um I signed up for a photography class in October of 2018 and I had the the injury in, in May and I didn't cancel it, so it meant I had to go. And I was sitting on the chair in the living room and my brain was kind of floating in my head like this. And I asked Mm. him, would you tell me if you thought I was, I shouldn't be going or I'm not able to go do this by myself. And I'm a yes, no kind of person. 
And he just looked at me and he said, you can always come home. And I oh, was isn't like, that wonderful. Yes, because I was expecting, yes, you're good or no, I don't think you can do it. And then it was like, well, you can always come home. And That's you know what, it's, it's, it's always, it's always the case if I'm on a trip and things aren't going well, or the weather's crappy or so on, it's like, you can always go home. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. No, he's really yeah. the right kind of person to be, to have as a partner in the brain injury. Hmm. Exactly. Now tell us Renee, because a lot of people don't know your story. Tell us how you got your brain injury. It's very, very unusual. Yeah. Unusual. That's a better word. <laughs> yes. The unusual injury that drove me up the wall for three years. I went to the dentist in May of 2018 and I had conscious sedation. So I have no recollection of what happened. And um, the dentist replaced two crowns and one of the teeth that he had replaced the crown of the, um, the gum was pulling away from the tooth. That's why the tooth, the crown was failing. And as he was drying off the, the tooth to glue the crown on, that air went between the, the gum and the tooth and went into my face and behind my eye and in my throat and chest and um, around the heart. But nobody knew at the time what was happening. Um, my husband brought me home and around about four o'clock in the afternoon, I was kind of getting a little bit more aware of what's going on. And I was like, so I came downstairs and I said, well, why do I look like this? It looked like somebody beat me up. And he said, oh, they thought you're allergic to latex. And I was like, well, that's news to me. Okay. Wow. But there was so much air in my throat. I could hardly talk or swallow. Mm -hmm. And then the next morning I had to call in sick. And I could hardly talk on the phone and I called a friend who's a massage therapist and I said, please, can you see me? Because I, you need to get the swelling out of my face because I can't see patients like this. I will scare them. And she kind of gave me one look and she said, no, this is not right. You need to go to the doctor. Went to the doctor and he about had a cow. He said, there is so much air in you and I don't know where it came from. You may have a punctured lung. You need to go to the emergency room. Goodness. Okay. In the emergency room. Uh, they take x-ray and CT scan and uh, the doctor came in and he said, if you have any vision changes, you need to tell us because the chances of you going blind is really, really big and your heart can stop because you have air around your heart. Oh, and you have to go to Spokane, which is two hours from here. So my husband says, okay, we'll go home and feed the dogs and then they'll take her. <laughs> Sense of urgency. The doctor <laughs> says the chopper is on its way, and I'm like, "Oh, oh, okay." Anyway, so I was there for 24 hours. Everybody and their brother and cousin saw me, and was like, "Well, you're not gonna die anytime soon. You can go home. You're fine." Well, fine means wow. you're not dying. And then I came home, and all freaking hell broke loose. I I got pleurisy, and I had swallowing problems, and blurred vision and oh anyway and mm. the the bad part of it is nobody understood how i got this injury nobody called it a brain injury um i went to an optometrist about 45 minutes from here he did some testing with me and he said you want vision therapy testing and i thought well i drove up here i could just as well have it and uh, oh my God, by the time she got done testing me, you have to follow things and look at the screen and draw. And I was holding onto the table because I was afraid I was gonna fall off my chair and it was to hold the table still because I thought it was moving. It was walking around the room. Wow. Anyway, and then they gave me the report and says, you need a level four brain injury program. And I thought, oh, okay. So I have damage to my eye. So this program will fix my eye. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I don't remember the, how these things all fit together, but anyway, had physical therapy and vision therapy and speech therapy for swallowing. And eventually had uh, occupational therapy. And then, um, oh, I had to renew my occupational therapy license in Washington and in Idaho. And 
I had to do some continued education and just randomly pick the online class, concussion and mild brain injury. I've worked with it. I can probably pass the test without even watching the, the videos and stuff. Yeah. And in the notes that you get, these are common signs and symptoms of concussion and mild brain injury, headache, which I didn't have. And the rest of them, the nine of them, I had them all. And I was like, oh, my God, you have a brain injury. Uh. Anyway, that's how I found out. And then I had to start telling doctors about it. And then they just kind of look at me and like, well, I don't understand how you got it. However, do, do go to ther physical, physical therapy and go to speech therapy because it will help you. How did they determine that it was the air from the dentist? How did they make that decision? Um, you know, if they, oh, I even got into an argument with a neurologist and I told her, I said, you know, to have pericardium, which is the air around the heart, mm -hmm. air has to f circulate. I think it's in the pulmonary vein. Well, yeah. for air to circulate in the pulmonary vein, it needs to be air in the blood. And if mm -hmm. that was true, then that blood circulated through my brain. Well, she told me I was nuts. Anyway, well, so eventually, kind of by accident, I found a neurologist in Seattle that somebody else um, knew and recommended her to me. Within 10 minutes during the visit, I took my CT scan report and the, uh, and the images and I gave her the report and she read it and she says, she looked at me and she says, of course you have a brain injury. She says, you have air behind your eye. 80% of your eye is in your brain. Goodness. But I don't know how you got it. Well, bottom line was no lawyer wanted to talk to touch my case with a 10 foot pole, say too expensive, too complicated to this and to that. And I lost my job because I can't read well enough or my language processing isn't good enough and the memory and all the other things that go with it. And I had to stop working. My license expired and I really don't have the energy or the drive to go struggle to do the continued education and pass all those tests and stuff to renew it. I'm 60. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. I don't I'm blame traveling. you. <laughs> so what did they do about the air in your body? Did it, does it um, go away? Oh, or? they, they put me on some really high dose antibiotics to make sure I didn't develop some kind of infection because mm -hmm. when stuff from your mouth goes into your body, the chances for infection is pretty high. Yeah, and that. oh, that gave me one whopper of a headache. It made me nauseous and everything. And then um, the, the swelling in my face went down. And then I had another CT scan, I think, two weeks later, and all the air was absorbed by the body. Oh, good. But the damage was done. Right. Anyway. That's so sad. But look at you now, though. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, okay, I got to tell you, for a living, I work for home health, which meant... I moved from house to house eight times a day to go work with patients. Hmm. And for me to stay home after this, for me was pure torture because I was used to go, 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 go. And um, when you work for home health, you're pretty much on your own. You like have a meeting every other week. You only call the office when you need something or they ask you something, you call them back. So yeah. it was a, independent job and having to stay home after that was really really torturous until i went to the to a photography class on the olympic peninsula went via seattle what the hell was i thinking that was before <laughs> i knew about all this stuff um and i was i think in port angeles i pulled off the road and i was crying i was so overwhelmed and so exhausted and it was raining and the wipers were going and ugh. anyway guess what i wanted to go home and i wanted to just stay home <laughs> but you know what um even with all the knowledge that i had as an ot and all the people i worked with Living it is different than watching it. And Isn't it? that overload thing, man, that was news to me. I knew about it, but 
I had no idea how hard it was. Yes. And how little it takes to get overloaded. Yes. Um, the advantage of traveling in the minivan with a bed in the fridge, you just park wherever you feel like it and say, I'm done. I'm taking a nap. And if you wake so up tell in the everyone morning, why you do that. Yeah. It's like in the morning you wake up and it's like, I'm tired. I don't feel like driving. Just hang out. <laughs> Nothing's running so, away. I don't have any reservations. I don't have to be anywhere a specific time. So it is kind of ideal. Now, whenever you started taking these trips, had you already been taking these trips before your brain no, injury? Or? No, I work like a crazy person. I don't know when to stop. <laughs> so this was a good distraction for you. Yes. And I, I do also want to mention to people, work really isn't everything. No. Because when you work in healthcare, you kind of get brainwashed and well, we don't have enough coverage. Can you see more patients? Or we just had another admit. Can you come help us? And you kind of feel like you have to. Mm -hmm. And you you kind of get in that habit of somebody calls you and say, hey, we, geez, we just had three admits after four o'clock this afternoon. Can you come help us? Which mm -hmm. means you work until eight or nine o'clock at night. Um, I wish back then that I knew when to draw the line. Yeah. Sorry, I have company. Yes, I know. <laughs> we love it when our four legged friends show up to the podcast. <laughs> the only problem I have with her is she snores. <laughs> and you probably That's can funny. hear her breathe. Anyway. That's hilarious. Well, you yeah. did turn this into a positive because you take you've taken beautiful photographs and if i could reach i would grab the one that you sent me i love it I, I look at it every day while i'm working well thank you i appreciate that you know um the photography kind of disappeared off the map there for a long time because um and that was one of the other things that i learned about living with brain injury is what they call lack of initiation mm -hmm. you just the idea just don't occur to you. And if it does, you don't have the energy to do it. You're exactly right. And the other problem that I had with that really fancy camera was I forgot what to do with it. I would sit by the river and I was like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to do it. And the other thing that I have trouble with is looking through the viewfinder. Um, when I, when I look through the viewfinder, I can only do it like for a few seconds at a time. And then if I, if I take the camera mm. down, I see all these white flashing lights oh, and gosh. then it's almost like my eye aches. Yeah. So I, now when I take pictures with the camera, I put it on the tripod and I use that little screen thing in the back and just look at that. And the other problem that I have is my balance is very vision based. So yeah. Um, if it's dark, I don't have any balance. I don't walk to the bathroom in the dark because, uh, mm -hmm. I don't, first, I don't know where it is and I don't know how to get, how, what is, I don't know what's upright. When yeah. we were painting the house earlier this year, that was, that was an experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. So instead of having a ladder like this, mm -hmm. I would put it against the wall like this. Mm -hmm. And the third rung was about as much as I could do. Because if I climbed higher, which I tried, your face is about this far from the wall. And then I had no stinking clue what is going on. And I felt like I'm going to fall off. So that yeah. was kind of scary. Um, and you get disoriented easily like that. Yes. You know, there's a, there's a test that some of the PT offices do is called the platform test. You stand on mm -hmm. a platform with, with your bare feet and then you, you're in front of this curved gray wall and there's no information on the wall. So you basically, it, it pretty much feels like being in space, but there are no stars. And then gotcha. there, there are four, um, eight conditions, four of them eyes open, four of them eyes closed. Two of them, the platform moves. Two of them, the wall moves and some oh of them, my. 
they both move. And then you stand in a harness um, because you will fall off. I did. I would have. I flunked that test so bad, my score didn't even make it onto the paper. I think I got zero zero percent for that test. Um, Oh, and it also determined that my center of gravity is behind my heels. Which is a really? very, which is a very interesting um, complication because yeah. and the first time this happened, my poor husband, I was out in the garden and he came to say good night, and he walked up to me, and as he was coming towards me, of, he's taller than I am, he was in my face. Well, he was coming towards me. Well, guess where I went? That way. So I grabbed him oh, by no. the shirt. Oh no. The poor man has chest hair. Yes, that was bad. Anyway, so now when he approaches me, he will take me by the arm and I take him by the pocket (laughs) (laughs) so that when he lets go of me, that I don't start backing up and fall over something. God forbid I fall over the dog. Anyway, yeah. But see, that's great that you guys worked through that and you came up with a solution. I just told somebody earlier today, you have to train the people around you when you have a brain injury. You do. Um, He he doesn't buy me birthday cards anymore. He writes me one in 14 font double space Arial so I can read it. Because a lot of these cards have cursive writing in them and I can't read that. Mm-hmm. And um, if he emails me and asks me to do something, it's just like one, two, three. Please go get something at Harbor Freight, something at Home Depot, something at Walmart, and that's it. And I print it out and I take it with me. So, you yeah, know, it does. I sympathize with you on the cards because they're hard for me to pick out myself. I'm colorblind. Oh, my God. And a lot of these cards nowadays if you ever look they'll have the same color background and like a lighter or darker version of the same color font it, it probably just i can't see it, it just yeah i can't see it, it? Mm-hmm. you know my my big frustration like the card thing is um i had to go get a card and you know how long those walls are with the cards on them mm-hmm. and you stand there and it's like can somebody just tell me where is the girl's birthday cards there was a lady there and I said, Hey man, do you see, I don't remember what I was shopping for. And she just kind of looked at me and she said that behind you. And I was like, thank you. That helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? We've... In public, I don't, I don't, I can't find somebody. I trace the track down an employee or somebody else is shopping and said, Hey, have you, have you seen the catch up? Because I can't find it. <laughs> yeah. I have found that I have to ask for help a lot more than I did prior to my brain injury, but you have to, you have to be your own advocate because someone's going to do it for you. Since we live in a small town, we have Walmart and Costco. And, um, what I really like about Walmart that on their app, if you type in what you're looking for, it will give you a list. And then if you, Mm. if you click on in store, it will tell you which aisle it's on. Yes, I love that feature. And then if I still can't find it, I'll just show it to an employee and say, hey, can you help me find this? Or Because on their devices, it actually has sections as well mm-hmm. um, that tells them where to find stuff. You know those guys that walk around with those fancy carts with the like eight yeah. things stacked inside of it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they even have more detail about the store. <laughs> yeah. So let's... Uh wrap it up with the exciting news a lot of people don't know but you have written a book oh yeah that's right (laughs) i have a copy of it but it's not within our arm's reach i need go go gadget arms do you have a copy of it in front of you yes does it it show up backwards no it shows up correctly okay sometimes cameras turn the words around you see the whole thing so this book is an amazing book. What she's done is uh, she's taken, like she said, photograph, photo, how's, how do you say it? 
photographs, images, art. Yeah. So she's put that to the paper and she describes to her, to, well, Renee, you, you tell it, you tell it better than I can. It's your book. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you how, the, I'll tell you how this started kind of by accident. Um, my husband writes, he has published like six books and right after the injury, there was a conference in our hometown and I went with him by lack of doing something else because we were going to stay in a hotel. So we didn't have to drive up and down and got to know the other people in the group. And one of the ladies said, honey, you got to stop sitting on the couch and come sit at the table. Well, that means if you sit at the table, you need to participate in writing and critiquing and that kind of thing. And I was like, you guys talk way too much for me, but I didn't say that <laughs> anyway. So I started writing something and my husband wasn't impressed with my writing. And he said, write, write about what you know. And I thought, okay. And I happened to have this app called Oilist and it would change a, a photograph into an oil painting. Mm -hmm. But it's a it's a process and but there's a little plus button on the screen so you can screenshot anytime you want. So as mm -hmm. this picture was evolving on the screen, if I liked something, I would just push the screenshot thing. And one night, I, I think it was a picture of a train track, but it looked like an explosion. And at that time, my memory was so bad, I could think something and forget what I thought. So I, I put it on a piece of paper and I wrote down what I thought about it. Um, and that is how the prologue and the book started. Um, I use a regular picture and then an altered picture to show what trouble with reading feels like, finding your words, dizziness, um, Nero fatigue, because there's like, I don't know, 15 or 16 of them in the book. Yeah. And then I have to say at the end of the three years when I pretty much knew I was going to be on disability and I was tired of arguing with doctors about what was wrong with me, I pretty much thought I'm going to go on this road trip and I'm going to call it good when I get back because I'm not willing to live like this. Yeah. And that road trip became the book. And then I came, the road trip was 9,461 miles over 84 days. And what's, what is kind of ironic is you had this physical journey where I had to do everything for myself. Hmm. I ran into trouble. The batteries wouldn't charge. Somebody aimed a gun at me. Um, I forgot the other things. The gun thing is kind of the one I never will forget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and then I came home and that is the, uh, the coming home is the epilogue in the book. And that is the part of the book that changed my mind about my plan that I had. Yeah. And that became the book. And you know what? I never thought that my book would look like that. Oh, I, le I left out to say, since I have so much trouble reading, I laid out the book in like columns, say like 35% of the width of the page. So you don't have to track all the way to the end of a line and then go to the next line and no paragraphs, just like short uh, phrases to communicate what I'm trying to say. Because mm -hmm. I tried to read a book after I got the brain injury written by a doctor. I got as far as the third page and I was like, I can't do this. Yeah. And I didn't even understand why not, because this was pretty early on. And, you know, this uh, recovering or discovering the new you after mm -hmm. this brain injury, it's a journey. And man, some of those yes. hills are very steep and you keep on falling back mm -hmm. and slipping down the hill and everything. But publishing this book was almost like it got me onto this plat, this neck big plateau that was a lot higher than where I started out at. Yeah. And it's therapeutic. It is. It is. Um, 
it was a huge accomplishment and and I really had a fantastic book designer that guy um met with me initially first he said no and then he said okay he'll he'll help me sorry about that you're fine (laughs) dog just took the mouse with her not the real the computer mouse um and I told him I said I have approached companies to lay out the book for me and they you cannot talk to anybody in real life you have to email and text and I was like I have expressive language problems. I try and communicate what I want. And then the other person that reads it, they don't get it at all. And it's super frustrating. So, mm-hmm. and he doesn't live too far away. And we met quite a few times and talked about the the inside of the book. And I thought he did a great job. And he really um, used my initial layout. He just made it look professional. Um, awesome, which I thought right. he did a great job with. Yeah, I like how you laid the book out. It's an e- it's easy to read the book, and that's you don't what get that, fatigued. Yes, that is what I wanted because I realized that if there are other people like me walking around on the planet, we are not mm-hmm. going to read conventional books. Right, but yeah, I love how you laid it out. It's easy read, and and the pictures, you you just have a very good act for being very descriptive as to what it feels like. Thank thank you. you I want to tell you something about those pictures though. Out of that 406 pictures in the book, eight of them are camera pictures. The others are all cell phone pictures. Isn't that amazing? Cell phones nowadays are so good. And, and you know what, Mm -hmm. if you get your composition right and your lighting and your everything, just push the button and you can always go tweak it a little bit in Apple photos or whatever's on my iPad. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love it. <laughs> and you know what? Taking pictures with a phone is so much less work and less thinking involved than having to go through all the steps on the camera, which is for me sometimes is so tiring and it kind of takes the fun out of it. Yeah, I can see there, that. <laughs> there are times that you that you want to take like a sunset picture, I would take it with the camera. There's one on the wall over there, but I don't think I should go take it off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not advisable. <laughs> no, it's kind of a tr- problem to get it back up there. Yeah. Mark will probably be like, Renee, what did you do? <laughs> yeah, because there's also now a refrigerator in front of it, so. Yeah, well, anyway. don't don't hurt yourself and don't, don't damage anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually getting ready to go on a road trip. And you know what's the other surprising thing about traveling is the amount of preparation and the amount of cognitive skills that you use to get ready to go. Mm -hmm. And then once you're on the road, you have to take into consideration traffic and weather. Is it going to snow? Will the wind blow? What time does the sun set? Uh, Is it full moon or not? Did you know that um, when the sun sets, the moon comes up? around full moon. So the sun Mm -hmm. sets on one side and here comes the moon. And then in the morning, when the sun comes up, the moon is just starting to disappear. So there's some interesting things about knowing when is it full moon. And the other thing you need to know if you're by the ocean high tide, you want to know when that is. Um, Yeah. Road conditions, (laughs) road cameras. uh, Yeah, it really it sounds like, oh, that's okay. You just get in the van and start driving. But there's a lot of thinking and planning and whatnot that goes with it. And I think it's good for your brain to do that. Yeah. I applaud you for doing that, Renee. That is awesome. You know, I never thought I would like it, but I do. Yeah, I'm a Dodge it Charger a kind of person, kind. man. Not a mini man, a Dodge Charger. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a special kind of person me a half hour in a car and i'm done i'm totally done mm-hmm. but yeah you have been very inspiring i'm so proud of your book and thank you for sending a copy to me you're welcome and i have i have left a review so you'll have to go check that out you have oh i can have, have to go look thank you so yeah. much i sure appreciate that <laughs> and when your book comes out Please send me a Word document because I figured I had to get Word to read to me. Okay. So I can leave you a review on Amazon. 
All right. I will definitely do that. Thank you for yeah. spending time with me today. And for those of you who are watching this, thank you so much for spending time with me and Renee today. And I should mention, Ashley usually kicks us out of here. So I had to play Ashley today. Ashley will be back next week, as I promised. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with a friend. So see you guys next time. Bye.